Hello, my name is Amanda Marchetti, and I'm the product manager for government solutions at Mirmet. I've been in this industry for about 17 years now, um, and I've worked everything from the government federal civil sector to the government defense and intelligence sector, as well as within the private industry for nine years at Maxar, working from everything in research and development upon the latest capabilities of their spacecraft um, to product management within their international defense and intelligence unit. For my past two years here at NearMap, I have just worked on helping NearMap to grow their capabilities within the government space. And so today, what I'd like to do is actually um, utilize a lot of that past experience to talk to you about imagery for the post-disaster recovery effort. Because as you are likely know, and you know, this is part of the reason you're probably drawn to listen to this webinar, is that the recovery effort is something, you know. Well, I'll take a step back actually. It's the response effort that tends to get the most, uh, most attention in any disaster scenario, but the recovery effort actually lasts much longer and has much more of a lasting impact to your community. So I'm glad that you're here and I have a lot to share with you. So I'm just gonna get on with it. And so as far as the agenda for this talk, I'm gonna add a little animation here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how public safety officials can maximize their operational resources with high resolution aerial imagery. The graphic that you're seeing right now is actually a graphic of the, you know, that's starting to document the recovery effort after Hurricane Laura in Lake Charles, Indiana. And so it starts with the pre uh, event imagery um, back in 2019. And then the image on around, well, really right after the disaster happened. We tend to try to get a plane up on the day of, if possible. And then October 2020 and November of 2020. And you can see how certain houses have started their repair work. Certain houses by November have finished their repair work. And then certain properties have not been touched yet. So that's the level, that's part of the level of detail that you need to in awareness for a proper recovery effort. But it doesn't stop at imagery itself. There's also other data sets that you can employ. Um, things like three-dimensional views that are going to help you communicate your situation easier across your various chains of command. They're also, they'll also help you in the modeling effort just to make your city resilient so you can develop that recovery strategy prior to the event happening. And in addition, there's you know, geospatial data like GIS data that can be created now from imagery using artificial intelligence that can help give you a leg up on the current state of your region so that you can be ready and again, plan that strategy for your forward-looking recovery effort. So moving forward, let me just talk to you about who we are. So I work for a company called Nearmap, and we are what we, we actually call ourselves a location intelligence company, not just an aerial imaging company. But we started with one idea, was that if we could change the way people view the world, we could transform the way that they work. And the way that they work, we mean that in terms of operational efficiency. And so we started out of Sydney, actually we started in Perth, Australia, and we've now moved to Sydney, Australia as our corporate headquarters. Um, but we've been operating in the United States since 2014, imaging every region, and I'll go into this later, um, of pop every region of populations of 55,000 and over up to three times a year. And that's the way that we're trying to change the way that people view the world so that they don't just have to rely on imagery that you know, they might find through a commercial resource or sorry, a public resource um, that might not be as current, but they can actually rely on imagery that's a higher resolution because if it's captured from an aircraft, it's a little bit closer to the ground and we'll talk about that. Um, and it's a little imagery that's a little more current and actually realistic to the current state of the ground. And so that, that is NIRMAM's vision. And since 2008, um, we have been just growing our capabilities to support that vision. So how is aerial imagery different? So let's take a step back and just make sure that we all understand the different types of imagery that you have available because you have a lot, which is fantastic. But sometimes it's hard to know what is what and when to use which type of imagery for which disaster and which severity, severity of disaster. And so we're gonna start 
and talk just at a very high level about what satellite capabilities, um, what like what your offerings are and what you can do with satellites, uh, what are aircraft capabilities and what comes with a drone capability. So starting with satellite, and I could talk for hours about this, but I'm gonna keep it at a very high level because we don't have a tremendous amount of time. But satellites are fantastic for frequent revisits. Um, your polar orbiting satellites can image once per day. They're limited though by, um, yeah, just four key factors actually that I have li listed here. But the key advantages of satellite, again, are that one revisit per day and, you know, the fact that they have a decent resolution. And so you can see what's happening on the ground, but they also have a really big footprint because when you think about that satellite, it's satellites, um, shoot, satellites, aerial cameras and drone cameras, they're all cameras. And so if you can think about it just from the perspective of your cell phone camera, when you take your cell phone and you put it really close to something and image it, you get a high resolution picture of that person or thing that you're taking a picture of. Now, when you pull that cell phone back, you're getting a bigger area. And so you might not be getting that close up headshot, but you're getting the surrounding area around a person or a feature, whatever you're imaging. But that resolution is not as clear. So you're not gonna see as the highest level of detail. Now take the same cell phone, throw it out on the space station um, outside and you're gonna get a beautiful image of our planet, but you're not necessarily gonna see a car on the street. And so this is where technology comes in. Once you get to a, an imaging sensor on a satellite, this is a very sophisticated imaging sensor. Um, and so it's taking pictures, but it is still, keep in mind, far away. So your resolution just isn't quite as tight as it would be on a camera that's a little closer to Earth. And so even though satellites are very sophisticated and they're growing in sophistication every day, they still are bound by resolution. Um, and so they operate between 30 centimeter and 30 meter resolution, depending on the sensor that you're working with. And they are limited by the following limitations that I mentioned. Cloud cover, because satellites are orbiting, and I'm gonna go back a slide, because satellites are orbiting on this polar orbit, the Earth, they just literally just chase, kind of chase their own tails throughout time. They're really dependent on the Earth moving underneath them and rotating, and them being in the right position at the right time in the Earth's rotation to get the picture that they've been requested to get. Now, if you take an account for the things that humans can't control for, cloud cover, if there's a cloud over your target, when the satellite's passing at that right position to catch the picture, then you're not going to see what you want to see. And then you also have to consider sun angle and the time of year that you're imaging, because satellites will always typically appear at every region at about the same time. And so you want to make sure that where you're imaging um, and the time of year that you're imaging isn't going to catch you with a where catch at a time where the sun angle is low. Because as you know, when you just take a walk outside, when the sun angle is low, you cast a long shadow on the street and you don't want that in your imagery. So you also have to contend with the competing satellite request. And so if you're expecting an area to be repeatedly revisited, um, it typically doesn't happen unless it's actually, if somebody has commercially tasked that satellite. And then lastly, you know, this call can cause inconsistent updates. And so when you're, when you're looking at imagery from a satellite, they're not necessarily going to collect it the same exact day or say same exact time period every year. So you have to just take into consideration changes such as leaf on or leaf off conditions. And um, yeah, just other, I guess, re other issues of inconsistency, unless Again, that satellite has been tasked for a sp very specific time period. And even then, there, like I said, there are other issues like clouds that can still get in the way. Now, if we move on to aerial, now you'll notice that the camera is getting a little closer to Earth. And now we can zoom in a little bit closer to the features on the ground. And we can see a higher level of detail between things like a sedan and a pickup truck. We can actually start to see what's in the bed of the pickup truck. 
And what you're looking at here are model aircraft. They're not, um, and so this is actually a model airfield. Um, and so these aircraft are actually quite small. And so it's just fantastic to be able to see them. And then another fun thing to point out, you can actually see the position of people on the ground. I can actually, I'm pretty sure this guy right here is actually just looking at his cell phone. Um, and so that's the fantastic thing about aircraft is you're getting that higher um, zoom level and that higher level of detail. Um, but you can also have a, you have, you know, pretty good control of your capture rates. And so there's still dependencies and there's still limitations and that's with any imaging provider. But by and large, I know, especially with NearMap, we can capture at the same rate and the, in the same time periods year over year and at the same collection um, cadence in, within the year. And so, the, but the dependencies that, you know, we have to battle are still clouds. Um, and there are certain areas that we're always just battling to get that cloud for the image. And then, um, so that's environmental conditions. And then, you know, we are regulated by the FAA as well. And so there are certain regulations that we have to adhere to. And so these are the complexities that we have to deal with. But um, yeah, we've, we've found ways to overcome most of these complexities. And so the, um, the difference though between an aircraft and a satellite is that aircraft, you know, typically have a smaller footprint, but the technology is improving. And so I'll just flip back to this slide. And so again, the satellite is in space, so you can get a much bigger, um, what we call swath width, and basically footprint of the image on the ground. You can collect huge regions with the right satellite. Aircraft are closer to the ground, and therefore you see that imaging footprint is also smaller. Um, the, but we get around this by the fact that, um, I'll just, but we get around this by the fact that near map can image at a much higher elevation and we can actually collect a much broader footprint on the ground. And then drones have an even smaller footprint still. Impeccable resolution because look at how close that camera is to the ground, but it can only collect a very, very small area. And so it just depends again on the, on the type of disaster that you have. Is this a regional disaster or hurricane? or a localized, you know, but, but high intensity tornado? Or is this um, something even more local, like just say a natural gas explosion? And, they, and so that level of severity and that level of regional, um, regional, um, gosh, what's the word? Yeah, regional effect is going to determine the type of imaging sensor that you want to choose. And so going now to drones, Drones have, the, again, that really that much smaller footprint. Um, and though I didn't have a, a coincident image of that same airfield, you can see how close you can actually zoom in and how the level of detail that you can see. So they're very high resolution. And the resolution is really dependent on the elevation of the drone. I just gave you a general uh, um, resolution here. But they are also very, you know, they're heavily regulated um, for a lot of good reasons and they can be quite pricey on the back end. And so just keep that in mind as you're choosing a sensor. So now I just wanna show you a little bit about NearMath and what does make us different and what we've been doing to actually overcome some of the you know, limitations in the aerial space. And so we do something really cool. Like I said earlier, we do a wider area capture because we created sensors and there are our own proprietary sensors um, that actually have the ability to fly high and capture big footprints. And so that helps us out tremendously to be able to keep our, our data as up-to-date as possible. And we collect up to three times a year in the US, up to six times a year in Australia, um, and up to three in Canada, and I think two to three in New Zealand as well. And so collecting the imagery is just one piece of the puzzle. The next bit of technology that we've employed, that's again proprietary to us, is this automated photogrammetry pipeline. And so as you could see, when, a aerial am when an aerial camera captures, we capture picture by picture by picture of a full region. And so there's lots of overlapping images that we have to stitch together. And so this processing pipeline, this can take you know, some companies really months to actually process all of the images into a nice geospatially accurate mosaic. 
However, what we do, we have a system of automation and we have, um, yeah, just our own, like I said, proprietary technology that allows us to take all of this data collected by our aerial sensor and pipe it through that pipeline and into the cloud, sometimes within one day's time. And so typically within a week of collection, you will see a newly collected region at your fingertips within our web-based platform. And so that's it. That's the power of NearMap is collecting big scales quickly, quickly getting them processed and into the hands of our customers. And we can provide that through a web-based platform, through an API. And then we also provide, you know, which both offer 24 seven access, but we do also offer the data offline as well. And so I talked already a little bit about coverage, but we cover, we do cover Australia, New Zealand, the US and Canada. And we cover areas of pop population values of 55,000 and above. And, and then we also cover the world in 3D. So I wanted you to get a quick picture of our 3D coverage, but we do cover um, just, yeah, wide regions of the country in 3D as well. And we update that once a year. And so moving forward, I just wanted to show you, you know, the benefit of this repeat capture. And so this is an area in Savannah, Georgia, um, where there were, I think, yeah, there was the pre-cat image in, on February 13th of 2016. And then you can see the post-hurricane damage on October 10th of 2016. And then you can see that recovery effort actually coming in as of January 19th, 2017. And so this repeat capture can actually show you the rate at which your recovery, recovery effort is succeeding. And so that's a huge benefit in having just a consistent, um, yeah, consistent repeat capture program. And again, we do this across the United States. So let me tell you a little bit about just the whole scope of commercial data at your fingertips here. And I'll tell you what makes it unique first. And so I've already covered high resolution, but we, you know, we image at 5.5 centimeters to 7.5 centimeters, which just allows you a closer, tighter view again to what's happening on the ground. And so you can zoom in a little closer. And then we already talked about that frequent update, but we also, you know, I mentioned earlier that we're really a location intelligence company more than just an aerial imaging company meaning that we don't just provide that aerial imaging ortho, we also provide um, panoramas, uh, which is a mosaic of oblique imagery, 3D data, as well as GIS layers that are derived from artificial intelligence. And so I'll walk you through all of those very quickly, just so you understand the types of content that are out there and commercially available to you. And then we also have that deep archive. In the United States, we've been collecting since 2014. And so you can actually go back and look at historical recovery efforts uh, to look at how you could improve for future recovery efforts. And then we provide, again, that instant access through a web-based platform and APIs. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention was that we're consistent. So we do, and I've mentioned this once, we consistently collect each region multiple times a year so that you can compare this year's imagery to last year's imagery and actually you know, create valuable analytics in terms of change detection. Um, but we also really, really focus on image quality at NearMap. And so that's just something that I think is, is worth noting. Uh, one of my favorite things to talk about is, because um, I think it's fascinating, is the fact that we have a psychologist on staff that actually measures the human response to imagery to make sure that the image that we're putting, you know, into the hands of our customers and in front of their customers is the easiest imagery to interpret on the market um, and most aesthetically pleasing. And so let me tell you real quick about a little bit about the type of content that's of commercially available through NearMap. And so I've talked about the vertical. So we do fly an imaging camera that flies over a region and collects vertical images on the ground. We stitch those together and we provide a beautiful mosaic of the entire region. But we also collect oblique images so that you can see the sides of buildings. So when you're rebuilding a structure, you can actually see level by level, you know, how the situation is improving on that project. Um, and then we stitch those images together to provide a seamless panorama so that when you're panning through our oblique imagery, 
you don't have to pan from a bleak image to a bleak image. It's all one seamless um, north, south, east, and west view. Um, but we provide oblique images as well because the oblique images are our raw data and they're the most accurate for measurement. So if you need to take measurements of height, um, yeah, an area, you can use our oblique imagery and our vertical imagery because they're largely unaltered. And then the last two are near map 3D. And so we provide photorealistic textured mesh and we provide a whole product line of other 3D products that I'll talk about shortly. And then we provide that GIS data through artificial intelligence. And so this is everything from building footprints to where swimming pools and solar panels were, and um, even information with regards to roofing characteristics. So when you're having to go through a region and rebuild a system of roofs, you can actually get a good idea of what the cost could be. And I'll talk to you about that in the forthcoming slides as well. So just real quick, I've mentioned what vertical imagery is. And I think I've already mentioned to you that our ground sampling distance or resolution is 5.5 centimeters to 7.5. That depends on which um, camera system that we're using at the time. We have Hypercam 1 that images at 7.5. And we have Hypercam 2 that images at 5.5. Um, our positional accuracy is at about 8.6 um, inches. And trying to think if there's anything else you need to know here. We provide obviously that same seamless pan and zoom experience that you would experience in other products. Um, but we easily, one thing we've really focused on is easy integration. And we like to say that instead of easy, the term insanely simple integration into GIS and CAD tools. Um, and then with our web browser platform that we call Map Browser, um, you have easy access to tools for measurement as well. So next, I want to talk to you about our panorama data. Our panorama data is just like I said earlier, it's our oblique data stitched into the seamless mosaic, allowing you that seamless pan and zoom experience and allowing you for multi spec, sorry, four different perspectives and cardinal view directions, because you can see every building and every structure in our panorama from a north, south, east and west view. And so it just allows you know, a higher level of um, experience and a higher level of information about your region um, and a higher level of access really to image interpretation of the feature on the ground. Because sometimes you just need to see the, the feature at a different angle to be confident of what you're interpreting. So Panorama is fantastic for that. However, because we've stitched all these pictures together, we've manipulated the pixels a little bit. So I wouldn't use our panorama data for measurement. And that's why we have what we call our oblique imagery. Our oblique imagery actually is, like I said earlier, the raw data off of our aircraft. And so it actually is undistorted or unmanipulated. Not that our panorama will ever look distorted, but it actually has been moved. The pixels have been moved a little bit. Our oblique data, what you're seeing right here, has not received any manipulation. And so everything is at the same scale and the same position that we collected it off the aircraft, which allows for a higher accuracy and measurement. And so when you're using this type of data in our map browser platform, this is when you will actually see all the measurement tools become activated because now you can take accurate, you know, height and area measurements. Um, you can also take area measurements in our vertical imagery as well. But the other benefit of oblique data is that you get multiple perspectives. And so we actually give you all of our data. When we capture obliques, we do capture the four cardinal directions, but we take multiple images in each of those directions. So again, for image interpretation, when you just need that right, like almost crook of your neck view at a feature on the ground to make sure that you're seeing what you think you're seeing, that's when these multiple perspectives of the view of the feature can come in handy. And so when you gain access to our oblique data, you get every image that we have collected, which is just fantastic for image interpretation. And like I said, height measurement, roof pitch and area measurement. So fantastic option. Um, yeah. And, so fantastic option and something that I think would be a critical resource in the recovery effort. 
And then lastly, we provide 3D data. And so this is highly detailed data of what I like to call photorealistic 3D. And what you're looking at right now is our textured mesh data set. Um, this data set is just fantastic for actually easily communicating crown conditions or pre-event conditions um, if you're using 3D from, pre from before the event just throughout your chain of command, because 3D images are sometimes easier for folks to interpret than 2D images. Um, and then they also, we also provide the ability to take measurements of these images as well. And then lastly, we have this 3D family. So it doesn't, we don't stop at just that textured mesh data. We also provide access to a point cloud data set. So you can work um, in an LAS format. So you can work with your existing LIDAR data. And then we provide access to digital surface models, digital terrain models, and true ortho as well. And so these different products are all created um, from that same textured mesh so that you have a consistent data type um, for whatever you know, your 3D needs are. And so I'll walk through some of the use cases for each of these 3D products. So I'll start with a digital surface model. Digital surface models are just, you know, an elevation profile really of the surrounding region. And they include the elevation profile of buildings and trees and everything on the earth's surface. And so they're useful for things like shade analysis, view shed analysis, line of sight, uh, radio frequency propagation. Um, so you know how your signals are actually moving in and around buildings and, um, and geomorphological st structures. Um, and you can use them, you know, really for a wide variety of use cases. DSMs are fantastic, but they're just a data set that really just provides you pixel by pixel. And we provide a seven, I'm uh, sorry, a 15 centimeter resolution on our DSM product. But we provide that at a pixel by pixel level so that you can get, you know, really a very high level of detail about the elevation profile of the ground. And so if you think about things like modeling for floods, you can actually start to see at 15 centimeter resolution where your, you know, what that flood level will be at that, you know, 10 year flood, 30 year flood to 100 year flood and what the risk is to your population. And then we also produce that textured mesh product I mentioned it's really great um, for rapid communication of what's going on in the ground because it's easy for people to see and understand. And it provides that immersive um, experience. It also provides a reduction in the need to actually drive out to a site to assess a condition. If you can see it in 3D from your desktop. And then point clouds are fantastic uh, to utilize with your existing LiDAR data sets. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of technical stuff you can do with a point cloud. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but, um, if you worked with them before, I think you'll, you'll find, you know, fantastic utility. Our point clouds do provide red, green, and blue, um, I guess values within each point, which allows actually helps you in your ability to classify features on the ground. And point clouds are generally pretty, you know, handy for editing things out of an image as well, if you know how to use them. Um, and then our point clouds generally come out um, at a resolution, you know, we say roughly that same 15 centimeter resolution or 24 points per meter. Um, if you've received the data offline, that point buyout value is higher. But if you download the data from our map browser platform, it's, it tends to come out at about 24 points per square meter. And then there's True Ortho. True Ortho is fantastic for digitizing. It gives you that, it, let me tell you actually what it is. It gives you that perfect top-down view of, an, of a region, what we call a perfectly native view. And so it's created from 3D data, which is why we put it as part of our 3D product line. But that perfectly nadir view actually gives you the ability to look into urban canyons and to peek into areas that are just difficult to see if there's any angle to the image. Um, and like I said earlier, it's great for digitization. If you want to digitize buildings, now they're all, especially in central business districts with your high rises, now they're all perfectly at nadir. And so that's that perfect top down view for, um, for mapping efforts. And we do provide this at 5.5 centimeters. 
And then lastly, we provide a digital terrain model. And some folks might also call this a digital elevation model. But what we're referring to here is an elevation model that ignores the existence of buildings and trees. And so if you look here, you'll see higher elevation and the brighter um, orange values and lower elevations and the purple values. So this higher elevation, notice it's not recognizing, you're not seeing changes in elevation values around buildings and trees. It is only looking at the earth as if all of the buildings and trees had been scaped off, scraped off of it, something that we call a bare earth. So this is valuable for mapping out contour lines. It's valuable for mobility mapping, flood analysis. So how far is the flood gonna move through a region? Um, at varying rates of severity. Um, and then customers also use this for ortho rectification. Now let me talk to you really quickly about GIS. So data that GIS data that we derive using artificial intelligence. We have a growing cap capability here. And this is because we have that rich archive of data. And so, like I said, we've been collecting this data since 2014. And so we know we have a rich amount of information locked inside of it. And so for the past couple of years, we've been working to unlock that data. And for the past two years, we have been just rolling out GIS products as a result of that. And so I've listed a few of these here, things like swimming pools, solar panels, roof material, roof shape, vegetation, ground surfaces, building footprints, tree overhang, construction sites, power poles, and power lines. But we're always growing this capability as well because we have proprietary software that allows us to actually scale our AI capability very rapidly. And so when we know, learn of a new feature that needs to be extract, extracted from an image, we can do that quickly and effectively. And then all of our data is available for visualization um, through our map browser platform, just our web-based platform. Um, and we've also created the ability to export data, to deliver offline, and to deliver through an API. So as far as data sets, I've already started to chat a little bit about this. Um, but the benefit of AI data is, again, because because we capture these huge regions at a high level of detail, you can see a high level of detail about the features on the ground, the tree canopy, the building structure, the sidewalk structure, um, really whatever you need to know. But we're doing this at scale. And so throughout your region, you can, you can enjoy the level of sophistication of the data set. The data is offered in both raster and vector format. Um, and so we provide it as a vector format, and we do have a, um, uh, a pretty sophisticated vectorization algorithm so that the GIS data that you enjoy is more traditional to what you've experienced in the past. And so it's good, it's, you know, high quality GIS data. And then we can also provide a raster data set so that you have a little more manipulation over the data itself, so that if you choose to um, you can actually, you know, you can view everything that our algorithms thought might be uh, a feature in question, such as a vegetation type or a road surface or a driveway surface. Um, or you can just enjoy our vector data, which just thresholds to the highest uh, level of confidence of our AI output. So the first pack I wanted to talk to you about was our surfaces pack. And this shows you everything from water bodies to lawn grass, asphalt, concrete, and natural barren earth. And so this is helpful for things, you know, when coupled with DTM, um, you can measure things like the distance uh, to water for flood risk analysis. You can do impervious surface mapping. You can map, you know, lawn prevalence for water consumption analysis. You can do all kinds of things with this. Uh, for vegetation, we actually, so we also produce a vegetation pack, which we can, honestly, we can provide both of those together to you and provide a land classification for you. But this tells you where your canopy is. Um, and then once you have your canopy in a vector format, you can actually start to quantify the canopy, which can actually can be used for one and load, what is it, I think fire load modeling for wildfire risk, but also just to know what are the areas that are most of risk of trees falling due to a hurricane. We actually can map tree overhang on a roof structure as well 
which will tell you those houses that are at higher risk of, of um, yeah, of need of repair after a wind event. And then we map building characteristics. So we don't just map building footprints, but we actually map the building height um, and as well as the story count on the building as well. And this is fantastic for public safety operations so that let's just say there is a flood and you flooded through your first floor elevation. Now you know, you know, at what elevation people are. And then you can also, you know, you can really use this for a wide variety of, of use cases. And then there's roof characteristics. And so we can actually tell you the roof material type and the roof shape of the roofs within your region, which is gonna help with things like rebuild cost estimates, rebuilding timelines and roof repair um, targeting. And so that your roofers actually know which houses to start with um, and where to move through. Lastly, all of this data has some has availability within our map browser application. That's our web-based application here. We're also available on the Esri marketplace. And so our imagery products are available on Esri. Um, I'm hoping to get our AI there soon. It's not there yet. And then lastly, we also provide a wide range of um, integration options, a WMS1, WMS2, um, API options, um, and other integration op options as well. So if that's of interest to you, your need in your community, just reach out to us. And then lastly, like I said, we can deliver offline. And so um, just lastly, just a, I guess is that differentiating um, uh, plug <laughs> for near map. And what makes us different is the fact that we are current. We are imaging in a natural cadence across the United States and urbanized areas two to sometimes four times a year. Um, we have clear, consistent coverage offering that high resolution 5.5 centimeter ground sampling distance or resolution. And we offer that ability to monitor change over time so that you can see your recovery effort progress naturally over time. And then we try to maintain that consistency in year over year capture timelines, but also consistency and quality between all of the images. And so that's one of the benefits of working with some of these, um, yeah, with modern aerial imagery. So now let me show you how some of this imagery and data can be employed in disaster and really the recovery effort. And so there's a lot of things to consider when considering what to do after disaster strikes. Um, yeah, first, obviously, you respond to the immediate threat to life and infrastructure. And that once that phase is over, there's a long process, you know, for, for there's a long process for that recovery effort that could last anywhere from, you know, one week's time to two weeks to 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, sometimes to years in the future. And so actually mapping the progression of that recovery effort is important. Um, it's imperative, actually, I think, to the alloc proper allocation of resources and quantifying the stage of recovery um, will actually help you track how much additional resource you might need as you're documenting, you know, how your region's improving year, um, week after week, month after month, or year after year. And then you can actually have some qualifying statements of the loss that's experienced, that been experienced in your community. And so it's just there's proof, that proof documentation of what's really happening in your community. And then you have that ability um, for debriefing and modeling for the lessons learned after your recovery effort to keep your city resilient and to learn so that the next time um, you go into a disaster situation, your city is resilient and your city is ready. And so you can make every recovery effort smarter, faster, and more efficient to the benefit of your full community year after year as you, yeah, just continue to improve your strategies. So I'm gonna start with a pre-event image in Lake Charles, Louisiana. This image was captured in November 3rd, 2019. And so you can see that the current state of Lake Charles, you can see, you know, the state of the residences, you can see the improvements that residences were um, 
were working on at the time. And you can see the existing conditions of things like the roofing, um, you know, on top of the residences, the ex any existing deterioration of the system. Um, yeah, and you can see, you know, conditions of things like swimming pools and really every asset and in infrastructure. I just chose a residential example here. And so this is sadly the state after Hurricane Laura hit um, Lake Charles uh, around August 27th of 2020. When the hurricane hit, it's, some areas were completely destroyed and then some roofing, some houses were, many houses were left standing just with a lot of roof damage. Um, you can see, it looks like some trees have fallen, many trees have fallen. And you can see the state of, you know, things like cars and swimming pools and other, other features in the ground. But when disaster happens, sometimes it helps to really um, find an easier method of communicating the damage on the ground. And this is where 3D can come in. And so when you image a disaster at the point of disaster, um, you can actually easily interpret, you know, where the downed trees are. Uh, without hesitation, where the damage and debris fields are. And you can even sometimes get a three-dimensional uh, volumetric loading value for the actual amount of debris as it's being piled and pushed to the ends of, in the ends of yards. And so that the three-dimensional capability and just mapping out, really starting, I guess, with where you stand in terms of the long-term recovery effort is, is quite valuable. Understanding the quantity of debris that you have and the amount of effort that it's going to take to get every person in your community, not just back to where they started, but better than where they started. And so this type of data can actually help you in better understanding the work and task you have ahead of you. And then we move on to the recovery effort. And so by October in Lake Charles, you can see they've already started to repair their roofing systems. And you can see active roofing repairs occurring on the ground. You can see the debris piles already, you know, or, you know, being piled against the roadway. And you can start to calculate, you know, the amount of work that's been done and then the amount of work that's still left to be done within the region, as you can see here. And then by November, you can see some roofs have already been repaired um, and these residents are in a much better place. Many roofs are still within that repair process and some structures um, just are, are not gonna be able to be rebuilt. But by mapping this, you can also see that the debris fields have started to move um, and debris has been offloaded out of the residences and we're on you know, a firm path towards recovery. But, by having this data, you just know the residents that are going to need more help, and you know the residents that are well on their way, and the residents that have recovered. And in the same sense, when you think about this, actually, in um, you know, in your infrastructure standpoint, using the same method as you monitoring a roof, you can actually monitor the progress of the rebuilding of a bridge or the rebuilding of a hospital or any critical infrastructure in your area. But again, we're doing this not just at this scale that you're seeing here with the impeccable visual of a neighborhood, but at a full region. And so the ability to quantify that information equips your team with the information that they need to strategically apply funding and strategically improve the lives and situations of the community at large. And so this is that zoomed out view. <laughs> And so you can see the pre-event, um, actually, sorry, this is the date of image. It's hard to see because we are zoomed out. Um, but if you look closely, you can see debris fields really littered all throughout here. And then you can see as of October, you know, boom, everybody is getting, you know, has received, I'm sure an impeccable amount of resource to start that rebuild process and get their roof roofing and, their residential structures um, back to, yeah, back to a better, back to a solid grounding. Um, but if you look here, I can see the structures that have started down this process and I can see structures that haven't yet. And then when I flip to November, now I can see the structures that have started on their rebuild process and structures that have finished that process, just like in the last scenario. 
and then having that historical, I think I mentioned this for earlier, but having that historical rate of capture just gives you an idea of um, really an extra level of resiliency to help you plan your recovery effort. And so you can look back towards, you know, past situations of recovery and actually look at how well the recovery effort went then and what would you change for your next recovery effort. So the historical, actually looking, you know, using the past to guide your future is imperative in any recovery effort. And so lastly, I'm just gonna show you just what image analytics can start to look like when you apply it on 2D, or really 3D imagery here, and some 2D imagery as well. And so what we're looking at here is um, congestion along emergency response points. And this was after a hurricane in Mexico Beach, Florida. I believe it was Hurricane Michael. Um, we did collect that region in 3D, but we could see the areas that we're gonna need, um, yeah, just the most help in that recovery effort. And really actually the most help in that response effort. And so moving forward, you can assess damage from your workstation. And also I would argue you can easily communicate damage when you're actually displaying some of your geospatial data in three dimensions. It's just easier for humans to understand things in three dimensions because that's what we see in. So it's easier interpretation and you can classify the level of destruction and the amount of effort and the amount of concentrated effort that's going to be needed to get these residents back up on their feet or in this infrastructure back up in service of the community. And you can see things like, you know, um, where debris has fallen. I've talked a little bit about debris loading, but you can also see where other features have been moved and thrown throughout the region in situations like this, um, just high wind events. So where boats have been thrown actually out into the overlying community, and this was the surrounding forest. Um, but it's helpful in helping, helping your residents retrieve their lost property or just to remove the debris. And then flood analysis is huge. And there's also this concept of sea level rise. And so sometimes the disaster isn't instantaneous, but it's gradual. And so when we're mapping our coastal communities and trying to get a better understanding of what is that potential effect of long-term sea level rise, you can actually, by modeling that you know, by taking that geospatial model that you're gonna create using things like digital terrain or DEM um, 3D models and other factors, you can actually take that model of where the ocean, where the water line's going to be in say 30, 40, you know, 100 years and model it within your imagery or within your 3D model as well to see you know, what is the effect going to be to my surrounding community and how can I plan now for what the future could look like, you know, in 30, 40 to 100 years. And then you can actually analyze, you know, the structures that are at most risk as well. And that really goes back to resiliency, but resiliency is just so important for understanding your recovery effort and what your recovery strategy is going to be. And so when you know the areas that are at most risk, the first part of your recovery effort is going to be targeting those structures and getting the boots on the ground and the people on the ground to check and make sure which of these residences that sadly you might have hypothesized and modeled that wouldn't make it through that 30 to 100 year flood, you can strategically have people plan to go out there um, to, yeah for that um, for that resulting recovery effort um, and just be ready. And you can also plan for the amount of um, the amount of public safety professionals that you're going to need to adequately resolve for the end-to end needs of your community. So we've talked a lot about the different types of imagery that are available, the different, you know, utilization, the different so the types of imagery that are available from the broad scale, from satellite imagery to aerial imagery to drone imagery. And then we put in that focus into what aerial imaging providers like NearMap can provide you. And then we've talked about how you can actually utilize that imagery in that recovery effort, both in a cadence of collection 
And so and NIRMEP offers an existing cadence, but you, you can also contract for an extended cadence. And so keep that in mind. And then there are certain things that you want to consider when you're actually trying, when you're actually, actually ready to access some of this commercially available data. And so when disaster strikes or when, as you're actually preparing for your recovery effort, go ahead and start considering the things I've listed on this slide. Things like the type, the ground sampling distance that you're going to need for the type of disaster that could hit, that could affect your city. For instance, if you have a small tornado that only affects a few properties, you might not need to access a satellite or even an aerial platform. You might just need a drone with a high resolution to just help you understand the effect to your community. But if it's a regional disaster, like a hurricane, you're probably gonna want an aerial to satellite platform. But you wanna know how close do you think you're gonna to need to zoom in to really monitor the effect of your community. So that's why you need to understand or start to think about, start to think about what ground sampling distance you're going to want or resolution. And then the view angles that you're going to need. Are you going to want to see just that top-down view or do you wanna see that oblique view? Um, which I recommend for understanding the recovery effort of structures, you know, the side and the siding of structures, or that 3D view to easily communicate across your chains of command and across your community how the rebuild effort is going. Um, that cadence of connect collection I already mentioned, how often, and this depends again on the size of disaster and the severity of the disaster. Um, and so how big of a region um, what do you need? And then what's that cadence of collection? If this disaster, you know, wasn't extremely severe, you may only need a, you know, a every couple month outlook. If the disaster was very severe, you might want to think about a long term cadence of collection, a multi year collection. And then seasonality, always consider things like leap on and leap off conditions, just so that you can have consistency in your imagery and just have an easier time um, at a more rapid interpretation of things on the ground, because you're going to want to move as fast as you can. And I already mentioned sudden angle earlier, just make sure that, you know, when you choose that cadence of collection, choose times of year where you're not going to, um, uh, in times of collection, that's not going to cast a long shadow. And that was everything that I had for you today from, <laughs> from everything from the different types of imagery to why, you know, the benefits of, I guess, aerial imaging and what near map can offer. And then how that imagery can be employed within the recovery effort. Um, but please reach out, you know, anytime. My name's Amanda Marchetti and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. And we just really appreciate your time and investment and learning more about the recovery effort through this website and through the other um, presentations that you're actually gonna see here. And stay tuned for the panel discussion as well, where all of us are gonna come together and talk to you more about how all of the technologies that are available come together to solve real world problems. So thank you for your time and have a great day.